Welcome to the National Women's Fitness Academy podcast. We're here to talk about women's health, female hormones, body image, and all things health and fitness. Welcome back to the Women's Fitness Academy podcast. I am one of your hosts, Ellen, an educator for Women's Fitness Academy, as well as a female empowerment coach specializing in binge eating and body image. Today, I am here with a huge inspiration to myself, and I'm sure that if you are into CrossFit, that you are going to recognize her name. Her name is Kate Gordon. She is the owner of CFK Nutrition. She is a part-time athlete I would say like a full-on athlete but she that's what she said about herself she has a podcast she just she wears many many hats and I'm super pumped to have her here and for you guys to get to know her a little bit more like I said the CrossFit girls who listen to this you might know who this person is um but everyone else yeah welcome Kate to the podcast thank you thank you for having me of course, of course. I'm super excited. And yeah, before we turn on the recording, we're just chatting and um, Kate actually used to train. So I used to live in Newcastle for those of you who followed me for a while, you probably noticed already. Um, And I trained at the gym where you used to train. And then mm-hmm. that's how I kind of found you because obviously I'm friends with those people. And I was like, oh my God, she's really cool. And then I like looked at your profile. I was like, wow, like she actually she look, knows what she's doing. <laughs> it's like CrossFit is two degrees of separation, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, yeah, I'm super excited to have you here. But for the, like, I obviously have followed you for a long time and I know, like, I've listened to your podcast, like, with your partner and followed your CrossFit career as well. But for the listeners who don't know you, who, how would you describe yourself? Um, actually, you asked me about how I would explain myself in a bit of an intro, and I'm like, oh, God, there are so many hats. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I started out CrossFit as an athlete and very quickly became a coach. That was what felt like my calling, and I really enjoyed that, and I liked working with people and helping people, and I really believed in the CrossFit method- methodology, and I still do. Um, I transitioned from CrossFit to nutrition because nutrition was something that I felt like I didn't fully understand. It wasn't something I was super confident coaching. Um, and I'd had a lot of struggles with it myself. So I really dove headfirst into nutrition um, study or or whatever you want to call it, where I was just trying to learn and I was experimenting on myself. And then that turned into coaching um, and it turned into me starting my own business with online nutrition coaching. Um, And then in my personal life, I've continued to kind of be an athlete and compete. And over the years, I've competed with uh, teams at the games, as well as a little bit of individual at a slightly lower level. And then uh, my partner and I are non-monogamous. So we talk about the process of having a relationship that's not the status quo and the trials and tribulations that come with just relationships in general. So, um, yeah, I'm someone that likes to, I guess, go down rabbit holes so when I have an <laughs> have a topic that piques my interest I really just t- <laughs> take it way too far which you know is a good thing and a bad thing <laughs> yeah oh yeah I can so relate to that as well it's I think a lot of people who do CrossFit kind of have that mentality because you kind of have to be obsessed with it to see any progress like if you're just gonna go once a week it's like like you're not really gonna see any changes but then yeah. you start obsessing you're like oh my god like I just start, got my first keeping pull-ups now I want to do butterfly pull-ups now I want to learn muscle ups it's just it's always something to learn yeah absolutely yeah so you said that you struggled a little bit with like nutrition and um stuff like that what was it that you were struggling with when you first started out Uh, Just lack of knowledge. You know, I was educated by social media and movies and magazines from the 1990s and the 2000s. And it's like, I wouldn't really call that an education, but it was where we got our information. So um, it was just a lot of messaging around like every woman should be dieting. Every woman needs to lose X amount of kilos. And um, I, I remember being in my early teens and just becoming aware of the fact that I was gaining weight. And uh, I did gymnastics for a couple of years and they weighed us, which was bizarre. I don't know why they weighed us, but I was like 12 when I started or maybe 11. And then when I was about 13 or 14, I stopped. And I remember them weighing me when I started and weighing me when I finished. And I'd 
put on weight because I'd grown probably a few feet and I'd, you know, like probably I actually put a lot of stuff. Really good of <laughs> yeah. I'd put on muscle and, you know, this thing called puberty, yeah. but I really, I was really worried about that. Like I was already well aware that we should fear weight gain and mm. it was instantly an issue. So I kind of came into puberty with this idea that like the scale increasing is a bad thing and we should all be trying to lose weight. And that's just, that's just what you do. Like I didn't really necessarily attach any insecurities about my body. I didn't, I was a pretty athletic kid. Like I didn't worry about being big, but it was just this messaging that I was like, Oh, I should lose weight. I should be doing this. And the number going up is not a good thing. Um, and so I remember kind of like trying to diet, quote unquote diet, which was just, you know, I would skip meals or I would try to eat one day and not eat the next. And none of them were successful because I couldn't stick to any of them. <laughs> but that was probably the beginning of some all or nothing patterns and which eventually really kind of put me on this path towards binge eating and just being in these like restrict binge cycles. Um, so I, I, um, when I was in university or even end of high school, I started seeing a personal trainer with my stepmom, which was a good thing and a bad thing. I started to get into fitness at that point. And so I think that that was a super beneficial thing. But I also started keeping things like a food diary and I would take it each week to this personal trainer and I would get a tick or a cross according to what I'd eaten. And so I would start to not want to write things in the food diary. I wouldn't want to like admit that I'd eaten something bad or I would binge on stuff that I knew that I wasn't meant to eat and I would feel guilty. So it was like you just see the early stages of these feelings and associations with food that was you know, nothing that a 17 year old should ever have to deal with or think about. It was just totally inappropriate, but there I was. Um, and that eventually kind of led me to trying a lot of different diets and a lot of fad diets. Like I remember doing the Ducan diet. When I started CrossFit, I got into paleo. I did the intermittent fasting thing. Um, what else? I never did carnivore or vegan. I think by the time that that became more trendy, I'd sort of figured out my own shit and was like, oh, no, I don't need to do any of that stuff. Um, but I've definitely done like the no sugar thing, the you know, some of those kinds of stuff. So um, always short term with long term consequences, meaning that the whole diet was pointless because I would regain any weight and I would ruin all the habits that I'd established. So <laughs> It was, yeah, this just misinformed, confused girl going through this overly, uh, like kind of, I want to say overly complex um, environment when it comes to food and nutrition, but it wasn't necessarily overly complex. It was that there was so much information that seemed to conflict and so much messaging that wasn't even about health. It was actually about size and all these secret strategies to lose weight like I remember in university buying diet pills and it was basically like you know green tea and caffeine like that was all they really were but there was some magical herb that I was like super secret I didn't tell anyone about it I ordered and had them delivered and it was like <laughs> just like and I even remember um going to the pharmacy in New Zealand I grew up in Auckland and trying to buy the um meal replacement shakes for weight loss like you know it was like jenny craig or weight watchers shakes and uh you could buy like a two week or month long program and i remember think being super embarrassed feeling like super like worried that people were going to judge me um and i wasn't even sure if i was allowed to buy them but I, I and i so i don't know if i actually got too scared to buy them but i was really like i need to get these meal replacement shakes so that was kind of my history with regards to food. When I got into CrossFit, as I think a lot of women experience when they start weightlifting and start doing physically demanding practices or sports or martial arts or whatever it is, you start to appreciate your body for different things, which is refreshing and a nice, nice mental shift. Um, but you, I often still would find myself feeling insecure and feeling like I needed to lose weight and I needed to look a certain way and I needed to change. So I kind of kept going down the route of like, oh, I should change how I'm eating. I should diet. I should lose weight until I started competing more. And then at that point it was like, oh, I actually just need to learn how to eat well and feel good and do it for health. So I started making better choices. Um, and then the last bad thing that happened with me when it came to food, this was in my late twenties, um, is I found myself with a coach who 
I'd approached a company looking for um, support with performance and also wanting to lean out, which is like, you know, now I run a nutrition company. It's like 99% of people come to us going, hey, I really want to support my training, but I want to lean out a little bit. And so we essentially will set people up at a maintenance position and then maybe we'll pull them down a little bit if maintenance isn't enough to just pull things, you know, like rein it in. A lot of us end up going and just being held a little bit more accountable and eat better food, better quality food. And we will naturally lean out just by purely having someone keeping their eye on us. Um, But in my case with this particular coach, I was put on really low calories. I was training twice a day and then I was traveling a fair bit for work. Um, One of my other hats is I work for CrossFit seminars. So um, I travel weekends and I would do a lot of international travel and all these kinds of things. And I would overeat on those trips and then come back and get back into routine. And every time I got back from one of those trips where I would eat more, I would have my calories reduced. So it got to the point where I was eating 1700 calories. I was training twice a day. I competed the year before at the CrossFit Games. Like it was wild. I ended up losing my period. I was crazy lean. Um, And the funny thing is social media for me was starting to grow a lot because I was posting a lot of images of me just shredded Mm -hmm. but I had no period and I was exhausted and I wasn't able to hit my lifts anymore my gymnastics got really good but that was it (laughs) everything else fell apart so it was it was absolutely not worth it and anybody who comes to me saying I need to uh, lose weight to get better at gymnastics I'm like absolutely fucking literally not you do you need to get stronger because I can tell you I've had far better success with gymnastics being 10 kilos heavier than I did back then when I was feeling like absolute balls. So yeah, that is a very long version of kind of my, my history with food and and eating and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, I can relate to it so much. And I, I'm sure that so many women listening to this are going to be like, yes, yes. <laughs> well, it's the crazy thing. We're all like, oh my God, that was me too. Yeah. How do we all get this thing so wrong? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we all think that, or most of us think that we're the only ones struggling. Like when I remember when I was fr- like first got into CrossFit, super similar journey to yourself, signed up with this company. They put me on really low calories. Every week I'd be like, I'll, lo- I'll hit the weight loss target. Be like, no, nah, no, nah, I think I want to lose a little bit more weight, drop the calories more and then hit a new target. Okay, now I want to lose more weight. And it was just like encouraged. Like, okay, if you want to lose more weight, cool. And yeah, yeah, super shredded, great gymnastics, really good at running and stuff like that. But always injured always just like overtraining yes. yeah didn't have any freedom I couldn't go out for a meal because I was so stressed about heating my macros and um, I think it's a very very common unfortunately something that a lot of females do experience and like even the stuff that you said with like your old PTs how they would like take off like if you eaten the foods that you were meant to eat and stuff like that and like I would like to think that people are we're moving away from there but unfortunately, there are still a lot of gyms who have that kind of mentality, a lot of PTs who are still very like, this is your meal plan, don't eat anything that's not on there. And of course, like, I don't blame the clients for lying about what they ate then. Like, you don't, we all have, especially us girls have the, like, you know, the good girl syndrome, like we want to be perfect, we want to do well, we want to get that validation. And especially from someone who is your coach, it's like, you want them to be proud of you. So it's kind of, I guess natural almost to lie to them because to get the validation from them. Yeah. Yeah. We, it's this, it's almost like (laughs) we have this um, epidemic of people that when they feel like they're failing, they stop checking in with their coach. So it's like, it is my current mission within the business with the people that, you know, coach for me um, and the clients that work with us Mm. is to try and spot that before it happens. And so when people miss a check-in or they get a little quiet, or even if they're not giving a lot of information, you know, it's like a lot of people just will avoid even going there. So they'll give the, it's like when someone, you know, everybody does it every day. It's like, how are you? Oh yeah, I'm good. And they could be having the worst day of their life and you wouldn't know. We just default say I'm good. And sometimes that happens when we are talking to some like a nutrition coach. And so <laughs> I'm trying to find ways to help women and men mm-hmm. learn how to be vulnerable with their shit. And like you said, we're all going through it, but we feel like we're on an island and we feel like we're suffering alone. And it's really difficult to expose our issues to someone even if it's someone that we've employed as a nutrition coach but I think you nailed it on the head where it's like 
our fear is that our nutrition coach, that person that we want to impress is going to be disappointed and we're going to feel a lot of shame and guilt. So we're trapped instead. Um, and I just wish that I could get people to openly talk about it when it goes wrong, because it's like the, the, the changes that you want to happen, they don't happen on the good days. Like, you know, the perfect environment, your best days when you feel really great. It's like, man, those days are easy to do the nutrition thing. It goes wrong on the bad days when you're tired, when you're stressed, when you've had some really hectic thing, just knock you around, life's throwing you a curveball, emotions are everywhere. And it's like, that's where food can become really, really challenging. And it's like, how do we talk about that stuff rather than just the good stuff? It's, it's this kind of challenge that I have for, for a lot of our clients where it's like, Hey, if you're getting quiet, I think that you might be hiding something or avoiding something or don't know how to open up. Mm. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. hundred percent. I think anyone who is a coach, obviously that a lot of females who listen to this podcast are either coaches or training to be coaches, or maybe just, just normal person who doesn't want to be a coach. And that's fine as well. But I think <laughs> anyone who's been in this industry knows exactly what you're talking about like I'm like yep 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 that's definitely happened like we've all had those clients but what would what would you recommend like if if you are a coach and you have a client and you're like mm, they're not to miss the check-ins like twice two times now and like haven't really been communicating with me like what would you recommend in a situation like that I think figuring out how to probe people for mm. information better is something that is a bit of a skill as a coach and Oftentimes it requires you to either share your own struggles. So I think, you know, there's a mistake that I see a lot of coaches make on social media where they present themselves as the perfect client as like, they're always cooking beautiful meals and they've got these great recipe ideas. And like, if they want a treat, they make a sugar-free brownie. And it's like, these are all useful and they're great and it's good information. And I think generally they are good decisions, but it's actually important for us to also see coaches have ice cream at the cinema and get a massive bucket of popcorn or like go out for me dinner two or three nights in a row when you're on a weekend away or something like that and have the chicken schnitzel or palmy at the pub one night, you know, it's like actually seeing that other people are also quote unquote imperfect is the key to helping other people open up about that stuff. So I think there has to be a, a way to level with people. Um, so either that's done by ensuring that your platform is authentic and a real representation of the good things and the bad things, which, you know, it's not, it's not binary. It's just that we eat different things at different times for different reasons. And we know that we're generally eating the foods that are whole foods that are going to provide us with the most nutrition, but it's also totally okay to eat foods that aren't necessarily the most healthy foods, but still be healthy people. So I think that is a really important piece of the puzzle. And then, like I said, with probing information, it's really easy to not ask questions that inquire deeper and further with people. Um, so I think, you know, I said before, if you ask someone like, how's your day? Usually it's like, oh, it's good. You can stop there, right? Most people do, but you could go one step further and you could go, well, tell me about what was your highlight? What was mm -hmm. the best part of your day? Okay. Well, what was one of your low lights? Did you have some shit come up today? What happened? Like, why, how do you feel about that? And, and just pushing people to, be, I guess, specific with their answers by being specific with your question. And I think it's, it takes a lot of confidence and courage to get really personal with people sometimes. Um, and hopefully, you know, coaches and clients have established trust with their relationship over a period, you know, a period of time where they've learned about each other and, and created this, you know, relationship that feels safe and secure. But um, yeah, I think it does take courage to ask questions that are bigger questions that are deeper questions. And also, assuming that you know it's not it's probably not about the food like I think that's probably been one of the biggest things breakthroughs in my coaching is when I talk to people about food we always end up talking about something else <laughs> it's like hey something stressful happened today hey something really sad happened to me today I feel really disappointed I feel really frustrated and there's always some kind of emotion some kind of experience something that's going on like uh something like in their relationship a frustration with their partner I remember this client I worked with for a long time and 
she made the most progress purely in implementing a date with her husband once a month. They'd been married for almost 20 years. She did all the groceries, all the cooking, all the housework, all the, you know, the, I guess, housewife duties. That was her role that she filled. And she was becoming super resentful of him. And it became really difficult for her to make changes in her nutrition because she was just overwhelmed with this workload and and just mental load of like I do all the food stuff and if I'm with the kids at home and I need something healthy to cook for myself I can't leave and do that and my husband won't do it for me Mm -hmm. and so I'm just like struggling here trying to do this thing and so rather than like essentially what I what I caught her out on was she's like look I've talked to my husband about it and like I made some joke and he responded really negatively and he got super defensive and I'm like man, that's not communicating. Like you making a joke, some snarky remark, getting a little bit passive aggressive with your partner about it because it's a way to communicate with a little bit of humor, right? That's not actually communicating. I know you think you've told them how you feel, but they cannot hear you when you're passing it off as a joke or as a microaggression, a little jab. So it's like, we actually started with rather than her sitting down and having a serious conversation about food. Cause she's like, I've done it a million times. I was like, okay, why don't you just focus on reconnecting as a couple because you're on the same team. And I think you've forgotten. So I was like, when was the last time you went on a date? And she was like, without the kids. Um, well, my oldest is eight years old. So in eight years, and I was like, Whoa. Wow. <laughs> okay. Your homework is to organize a date with your husband without the kids just like one day at some point this month and uh it was the most positive thing she could have experienced with regards to you know her relationship and her home life and ultimately her ability to make positive changes with her nutrition like it was it was this trickle down effect right um so I think as coaches we have to have a broad understanding of the things that impact food because if we talk about meal prep and we talk about how to get protein all the time, you're going to run out of tactics because they're not relevant to the actual problem you're dealing with. Mm, Yes. Uh, I think if if you guys are watching this, you'll see my head. Yes, yes, yes. But I don't want to keep saying, (laughs) because I hate listening to those podcasts where the other person goes, "Mm, mmm, mmm, the whole time. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I'm saying you're like, try not to make annoying noises. Yeah, I'm like, just not, just not. <laughs> but I agree so much with every single thing that you're saying. And it is so fucking true that it's not about the food. Like mm. 99% of the population knows basically what to eat. Yeah, okay, maybe not the exact amount of protein that will be good for their bodies and carbs and yada, yada. But most people know that broccoli is full of nutrients. Donuts is full of sugar. Like most people know this yeah. stuff. It's yeah. not really about the food. And it's so interesting, like when you first start coaching, I found it, it was it was a lot of nutrition talk. It was like, eat this, eat that. What's your my fitness plan looking like? La, 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 la. But then as you transition and grow as a coach, like you said, you're able to have those deeper conversations with people. It's like, okay, my, your day was good. Oh, why was it good? What happened? Not just those superficial things, but like guys, if you're listening, like that is normal to start off like that but when you grow as a person and as a coach the deeper conversations with your clients are also going to happen but you can only really have a deep conversation with someone if you can connect to that deep part of yourself as well so like having a mentor I think is so good for people who are new coaches just be able to see like okay well how did you treat this situation with this client like why do you think they're not getting results like okay maybe it's not really about the food for them like with your client it wasn't really about the food it was about the relationship and you know when that increased like the relationship got better her relationship with food got better and her I'm sure her training improved and her body composition probably changed as well because everything is connected yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, what you said about it's how, how it's a reflection of how deep you've gone with yourself. I, I definitely think that's, that's true, especially um, when you've been talking to coaches who have just done the calorie deficit for a period of time and then tracking, but at maintenance. And then, you know, a few months later, they might go into a calorie deficit again. If you're talking to a coach who's essentially existed within those fairly narrow parameters, they probably have challenged themselves to do the stuff that's quite confronting and exposes, you know, your insecurities around your body or your weight or whatever it is. Mm. And I know for me, you know, if you 
gotten coaching from me like probably seven, eight years ago. Like I was that person and I was just trying to eat well. And and then when I felt like I needed to lose weight, I'd, I'd eat in a deficit, but I was pretty much tracking 24 seven. And there wasn't anything massive that I could have identified as like why I was the way I was or the reason that I was behaving in certain ways. But after getting off tracking, after focusing on like, hey, man, I've got this thing with like restricting food and then overeating. How do I, what is that? What do I need to do about that? Um, and, and essentially breaking all the rules that I created around food and diet and, you know, all the things that you'd spent 15 years learning from when you started dieting as a preteen. It's like you just got a collection of food rules. And I'm like, okay, I have all these rules. I'm going to break them. And I don't know what the fuck's going to happen. <laughs> but I'm okay with gaining weight. And all I'm gonna focus on is my relationship with, really, I would say food, but it was ultimately my, my relationship with myself. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my main goal was I wanted to address my binge eating. Um, and so it was like, when I said those two things, it was like, cool. I don't care about how I look. I don't care about the scales. I don't care about the tracking. I don't care about the quantities of food. I don't care about anything else except for getting to the bottom of this. Mm. Um, and, and that was a really big eye opener. And I know that for me, it was it was like I kind of reintroduced myself to me, <laughs> and it was like, oh, hey, there's all this stuff going on that we just never address because we'd never turn that rock over. Um, so yeah, I think that. When you're talking to coaches who perhaps haven't done that, you're probably going to end up with those coaches that talk more about like, you know, protein numbers um, and they're happy to give you a meal plan. Um, And that's why I know for me and and I'm sure for you, it's like I really refuse to give people often what they're looking for because I'm like, no, I'm not going to give you what you want. I'm going to try and give you what you need. And those two things are often very different. And I know it's frustrating for you right now but you need to take this on and try it out. Just try it out. Just give me, <laughs> I'm like, just give me a couple months and see how you go. Cause I promise you, this is better than all the other shit out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, with like giving it's, it's, it's hard as a coach sometimes to say no and to like really stay in like with your values and how those boundaries set. Um, and it's, it's also something that comes with growth and, yeah, like you said, like when you first start coaching, like God, I was exactly the same. Like if you would have been one of my early clients and it would have been like protein, macros, this, that. And it was just because I wasn't ready. I didn't know why I was obsessed with tracking my food. I didn't know that I had like this crazy obsession about how I looked. And that's something that comes with doing the deeper work. And when you are actually doing that deeper work, you, like, you're going to notice that your clients are going to get more like, amazing results as well. Um, because you reflect onto your clients basically that they're basically your clients are basically just a mirror on for you for how, how who you are and what the stuff that you're working on and you're going to attract the people that fit into that criteria for where you are in your life at that moment so if you're starting off now as a coach and you focus on protein mac- like macros and meal plans or whatever and that feels right for you right now that's fine you're going to attract those clients but then if you one day start doing that work you're going to notice that that shift and that's amazing. Like you, I don't think that you need to be the same coach forever. I think if you are, then this probably is something that you that should dig a bit deeper there. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I know I'm, I, my coaching has changed a lot over the years, even with CrossFit. And I think mm. one of the things that I really liked reading, and I can't remember who it was. It might have been like one of the CrossFit seminar staff coaches from the US or something, but it was, she put up a photo of the gravel and I think it was just like, you know, outside the front of their gym Mm. and it said step one care. And it was like just such a beautiful, short, concise (laughs) message. And that was that was also at a time where I was getting really into like stoic philosophy and I was reading a daily stoic and I was practicing um, like affirmations and I was writing in the five minute journal and just like doing some of these practices where I was really challenging like my, like who I was versus my emotional self. And I remember reading that and also reading virtue over happiness, that phrase. And I think it's like Marcus Aurelius or one of those like, you know, stoic philosophers. And it just spoke to me with a message that meant, you know, you've heard probably people saying like coaches aren't there to be your friend. And I understand the, the concept, 
but I also think, you know, like the whole, like, you, I'm not here to be your friend. I'm like, don't be a dick, man. Like, you don't need to be a dick about it. Like, you can still be friends with people and be oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. But I think, <laughs> I think the idea of like caring about people means that before you worry about your own feelings or how they might perceive you or your relationship with them, or even in to some degree, their feelings you worry about what's best for them. And so you truly have someone's best interest at heart. And what that means for, you know, not just clients, but friends and people that you train with and family and partners, it means that I'm going to set aside my own like desire to self-preserve and, and put myself first and, and want to be liked and want to be accepted and be loved in order to give you what you need and that, what whatever that might be, the truth that might be um, the the coaching cue of like, hey, you need to take the weight off the bar right now. Mm -hmm. It might be the nutrition thing of you aren't tracking. I'm not going to let you track until we deal with this. You can track at some point, but I need you to address your binge and restrict cycles. Like this isn't okay and tracking is not going to solve that. So it's like the truth can be really hard, but when you put the – Put the lens of I just care so much that I'm willing to give you the information that might be hard to take, mm. then it cuts through a lot of that like, oh, but I'm worried about what they'll think or I'm worried about if I hurt their feelings or like they might critis criticize me because like, I feel like I'm criticizing them. And it's like, no, man, if you care as a coach, then you, you actually learn to set aside your own emotions um, and your own kind of bullshit and, and just give people the hold cut, the cold hard facts in a way that is, you know, tactful. I think that's part of coaching as well. Like, it's not like we shit on people. Um, but I think the truth is, <laughs> is really powerful um, when it's given in a way that can, you know, help people be better. Yeah, 100%. And yeah, like your client's probably not going to want to hear it. Like, especially when it comes to binge eating, it's like, look, I know you want to lose weight. I know that's the biggest priority for you right now, but at the moment you're not sticking to your calories anyway. So let's pause that and that that is a tough conversation for someone to have like when they are so in that hole of hating how they look and you, you know can't even walk past the mirror without crying and just binging every, every second day like the, the thought of giving up losing weight is is gonna be hard and as a coach you are going to have to have hard conversations but like you said like it is all about that care that you have for your client and really trying to explain that that to them as well um and you know they might get really triggered at the start and but in all of the times that I've done it like they always like yeah they might get triggered but then the next day they'll sleep on and be like okay yeah you were actually right yeah <laughs> you were still, okay you were right <laughs> yeah sorry that I overreacted basically yeah. <laughs> but you yeah, know it's, it's all part of being a coach and like learning you just have to become such a good reader of people and how to interact with different people um, and also learn to not take anything personally. Like, you know, if someone leaves you because you said something or someone gets triggered, like you're not going to be everyone's cup of tea. Not everyone's going to want to hear what you have to say. And some people are just not ready for it. Yeah, it's funny. The the navigation of conversation that has to happen when you're telling the truth is really tricky. And it's like, it's the same thing that happens in relationships when you're having to have a hard conversation mm -hmm. and you learn skills around it. And I think some of the skills are that you avoid blaming people. You take on your own part the way that you might have contributed and you speak about what you feel rather than telling them what they've done wrong. Yeah. So a lot of it comes from your perspective rather than you essentially telling them their story. It's mm -hmm. like, no, you, you tell your story and you have to be ready to accept their story um, and understand their perspective. And when you have that level of empathy, then the truth can be delivered in a way that they will be open to because the first thing that happens, and this is what coaches will be super familiar with, is people get really defensive um, and they will stonewall and block you off and not be open to your feedback. And it's really hard to break through that if you if you accidentally get someone defensive. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of the time you have to, and that's where sharing your own experience is super helpful because you're like, hey, I know what's going on here because let me tell you, this was me like six years ago or in, in, when I was 21, I was doing exactly what you were doing and I get it. But here's what's going to happen if you keep doing, going down this path. And uh, I know for myself, like, 
I've become pretty bossy. And so, you know, some of the shift that happens with coaches, we were talking about coaches that are offering like macros and weight loss calories and, and those kinds of things. You're often out there searching for people like you're quite and and I'm going to say desperate, but, you know, not necessarily in a negative way. It's just desperate relative to someone who is not looking for clients. It's like when you're new and you're in the business and you're trying to get your claws into people and you're trying to bring people in like you are a little bit desperate and you're really keen and you're really eager. And so you want to give people what they want. You want to be attractive to people. And it's like, you know, the first rule of like dating is the harder you try, the more unattractive you become. Right. It's like, that's like, you got to play hard to get a little bit. So it's the same thing. The harder you try, the more you give to them, the more you tend to form to what they want or pander to people. And so often you're not true to your own values and what you want because you're just trying to find people and you're giving them what you think they want. Mm -hmm. And what happens over time with like, you know, I've seen it with every coach is it's like they go from like wanting clients and, and giving people whatever they want to slowly being like, you know what? I actually, I'm not interested in those clients. This is the way that I do things. And if you want to work with me, this, this is how we're going to do it. And, <laughs> and so I, I find myself on the phone with new clients now, just like giving them the rundown of what's going to happen. Like they explain their story. They give me a bit of a brief and then I'm like, okay, so here's what's going to happen now. You're going to do this. <laughs> we're going to do this for this many weeks. I know you're going to experience a few of these emotions and that's okay. We're going to work through that rough patch. And then here's what's going to happen. And it's like, boom, boom, boom. Here's what you're doing. I'm a, I'm the boss. Like I'm taking, I'm taking control. And yeah. so I think, <laughs> I think when coaches get to that point, you've, you've probably found yourself in a, in a position where you're no longer desperate. You want clients that align with you. And so you're actually happy to say no to people in order to say, to say yes to the right people. Um, and so you just really, you you mature, I guess, is really probably the, the word to use. It's like you, you're not so worried about um, about having everybody want to work with you and you, you, you'd you rather have certain people work with you. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And it is the same thing, like you said, with relationship, it's all about the communication and boundaries and knowing what, what can I say? What can I do? Where is like, even just like checking stuff. Like when I first started off, it's like checking whenever you want, I will reply to you whenever. Now it's like, no, nah, if it's not done by this day, mm, it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. And you need those boundaries and you need, and as long as you have that communication and same thing goes for relationships, as long as you have your set boundaries, what you want in a partner or what you want to attract and can communicate that openly, like it, it, it will be fine. It's just when we're kind of afraid of the other person's opinion and people pleasing because we want everyone to like us and no one to get upset and we don't really scrap our boundaries. We scrap all values and everything that we is important to us. And it's like, okay, well, if I don't have any of this, who am I as a person? Who am I as a coach? What do I actually like? Who do I want to be working with? Who do I want to attract as a partner? So it, it really does go hand in hand. And I mean, like everything we do is connected. So if you're a confused coach who's really desperate for clients, you're also going to be a confused person looking for a partner or looking for friends or looking for whatever it is, because everything does connect eventually. Mm -hmm. um, but which this leads us into relationships. And I do really want to talk to you about that as well, because I think it's so, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot myself. And I've had a lot of conversations with my friends who have also been thinking of having open relationships and um, how it's becoming a bit more, I don't know if it's becoming more normalized or if it's just that people are talking about it more and it before it was happening a bit more in the shadows. Um, but like, how how did you get into onto this path with your partner or did you start even before your partner yeah so um I think it's always useful to define a few terms because open relationships and non-monogamy and polyamory can be super confusing for people mm -hmm. um and I know it's it's like when I learned about CrossFit or tracking macros it's it's yeah. a new language <laughs> so you can like <laughs> yeah, figure yeah. things out um but I definitely think it's becoming more like more common more prolific more talked about mm -hmm. so much information online that you can read more about it and and it's just being shared more I think it was still happening but like you said probably more discreetly more hidden away you know tucked into little corners but um I basically had found myself 
when I was in my late 20s, kind of going through a string of short-term relationships that were monogamous and they were not planned to be monogamous. They were just monogamous by default because that was what I did and that was what I figured was the right thing to do. That's the example I had as a kid that many of us have had as kids or through the media or through whatever. It's like monogamy is the the, the main form that people take or well, structure in relationships. But there is different structures. There are different frameworks. Um, and so I'd kind of come out of these relationships and every time I got out of one, I'd be like, I really like being single. Like I have so much freedom. I love gaining my time back. I love just thinking about me and I never consider anyone else when I make decisions. I'm much more spontaneous. I can really put my time and energy into my goals or my business or whatever it was. So I really enjoyed the independence that I had. And I felt like I would lose that in relationships. And not only did I lose that, but the relationships weren't that good anyway. So it was like, why am I making such a big sacrifice in these relationships with people that aren't making the same sacrifice back? And also, is this okay to sacrifice myself in this way in a relationship? Like I'm, I'm kind of all or nothing. And obviously, like you said, it all connects. I was all or nothing with my food and I'm all or nothing with my relationships. So I would be like, I'm all in. I'm not interested in anyone else. I'm going to focus on this one person and I'm going to cut everything out of my life that doesn't help me be with them. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was just like, I think I'm losing myself. I think I'm compromising too much. They're not working out. I, I, I haven't figured out like why, but it's just not, it just didn't, I guess I got to a point where I was like, I don't think, I don't think I believe in monogamy. Like my parents are separated. I, my, my dad's been married three times. My like, you know, I've kind of got these broken people that were monogamous their whole lives. And I'm like, well, I've got a lot of evidence that it doesn't work. So why am I pursuing that same path? And when I started looking into it, you can go and find crazy statistics about marriage. And it's like, you know, 50% of marriages or something. And I don't quote me on that, but it's like 50% of marriages end in divorce. And then the relationships that do last, you know, as 80 years, 60 years, 50 years, a lot of them aren't actually happy and fulfilling relationships. We actually don't know. We seem to use time is the gold standard but it's not it doesn't it doesn't actually tell you anything about the relationship mm -hmm. um so I was kind of like I really like being single I'm totally all or nothing with the relationships and monogamy isn't working for me and I haven't seen it work for anybody else what am I going to do and so the first step that I took was like I just want to be single I just want to deliberately be single and not that I hadn't been single before I'd been single I, I've not really had that many long-term relationships but I'd never deliberately been single. Like I'd never been like, I'm going to be single and I'm going to casually date people, hook up, have fun sex, like do that thing on purpose because I'd never done that before. And I just was like, you know what, let's just do six months of like being single. And then that was when I started to see online, like I followed a couple of people who were talking about solo poly. So solo poly is solo polyamory. And to me, I was like, well, isn't that just like dating around? Surely it's just being single and seeing multiple people, but it's a little bit more transparent than that. And it essentially conveys this idea that you're associated, you've associated yourself with polyamorous principles and values. So it's like, Hey, you might be single right now, but you're a polyamorous at heart. And so you want to see multiple people and develop relationships with multiple people, whether it's romantic or platonic or sexual or whatever it is. So it's like, it's a little bit of a ethos, I would say. Um, and then after seeing that, I, I actually met my current partner, Greg on Tinder and it was during COVID lockdown. So I was in Melbourne and Melbourne was the most locked down city in the world. We had a 5k radius. Um, we had a curfew, so you couldn't leave the house between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m. We had uh, rules where you couldn't leave the house unless they were for four reasons, which was buying food, going to the pharmacy, going to the doctor, or going to care for someone who needed like care, like a kid, like I think it was like a um, someone who was sick, someone who was whatever. It was like those were your four reasons. So super strict rules and I'd met Greg online. <laughs> so our first like two dates were Zoom dates and then we had a few phone calls. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we started talking about polyamory really early on because this was just all happening at the same time. And I'd said to him, like, I'm not interested in a relationship right now. Um, and what are your thoughts on polyamory and like what structures have you had in the past with your relationships and what's your stance? And we just 
started talking about it really early on because I was so intrigued by it. And he was someone who had a little bit of experience just casually dating people who were also practicing open marriages or open relationships or polyamory, um, as well as was in like a kind of community in Melbourne that were sex positive. And so it was like, oh, I'm, I'm talking to someone who gets it, who really understands and has really interesting thoughts and ideas really early on that we weren't going to rush into trying to get into a relationship or define anything. Like we were like, we're not interested in, you know, pursuing a relationship or even making the statement like, I'm just going to look for something short term, but if it becomes long term, then that's okay. You know, it was like, that's what I'd done in the past where it's like, I'm not looking for anything, but if something happens, then that's cool. And so it was like, you were kind of always hoping for something long term, but you would basically settle for short term or like, you know, it, it would save you to be like, oh, well, it didn't work out. It's cool. I only want a short term anyway. So I, we essentially, I said to him like, Hey, I'm looking for interesting connections and the connections that I like the most I'll pursue and spend my time with. Like that's, that's me. That's what I'm looking for right now. Um, and he was like, that's great. Like, that's perfect. That's what I'm looking for. And I think it was, you know, I said before, when you're desperate, you really <laughs> don't look attractive. And so saying like, Hey, I'm not really pursuing anything right now, I think is like super magnetic for people. <laughs> So he was like, oh, I'm talking to someone who actually isn't desperate, who isn't like trying to push me into a relationship, who isn't trying to make me monogamous. And it was like, so he was really interested in me and really wanted to pursue the connection, which it was like, okay, cool. Like I actually have someone who's now kind of chasing me or not chasing me, but someone who's just investing a lot of time with me. Whereas in the past, you know, you start talking to guys and you start to like zone in on them a little bit because you're interested in them and they back off. And you're like, oh, what the fuck, what happened? So <laughs> it was kind of the opposite with Greg. And uh, yeah, we just from the beginning had said, hey, let's just like play with dating other people and talking about it. I think like, you know, I'm seeing people, if you're seeing people, you're talking to people like, you know, like, hey, what would you do? Would you tell me? Like, I would love to know. I wouldn't worry about it. And we could have this interesting conversation about who you're sleeping with and who I'm sleeping with and like see, just be honest, like just be transparent and practice that deliberately. Um, and so, yeah, that was kind of the beginning of it. And then we just kept seeing each other. And then he eventually actually formally asked me to be his partner. And that was when we were like, yes, but obviously non-monogamously. So I said before, defining terms is helpful. So we say that we are consensually non-monogamous. A lot of people use the term like ethically non-monogamous, um, but essentially like we're in a committed romantic relationship with each other. We now live together. We're planning on having kids together or getting married at some point. Like we have a very deep connection that actually feels very monogamous, but we on the side date people. We hook up with other people. Um, we will bring people in like to have group sexual experiences or go to sex clubs because we like to explore sexually. Um, and so we basically have this dynamic where it is super flexible and it allows for a lot of stuff to happen together or separately. And so you have this sense of independence and freedom that you have kind of when you're single, along with the, the enjoyable elements of being totally infatuated and committed to someone. And that was kind of exactly what I ultimately felt like I would work for me where I got to feel like I was kind of single and then also in a relationship and this was really the best of both worlds so that is how it all started <laughs> wow I just have so many questions like first of all do you ever get jealous all or the time <laughs> yeah I um jealousy is like a very tricky thing it's I don't even really think about jealousy. I usually think about my insecurities. Mm. So in terms of like, who's the other girl? What does she look like? How old is she? Is she blonde or is she brunette? Does she lift? Is she skinny? Like what is, like those are all my insecurities about me being projected out. So it's like that stuff I can like immediately put my like finger on the button. I'm like, boom, insecurity about my body. 
Then there are insecurities around, is he dating more people than me? Is he getting better? Is he having better luck? Is he like having better dates than me? Is he having more hookups? And so it's a little bit of like uh, scorekeeping essentially. And that's a little bit more of envy. So jealousy is when you're afraid someone's going to take something that you have. And envy is when you're afraid that you're going to lose something. Um, uh, is it lose something? No, envy is when someone has something that you want. Mm-hmm. So those are kind of separate things. So I get essentially FOMO. It's like if he's dating more than me or he's getting more or he's better and with hookups, I'm like, oh, like why, why am I not having that? Like, am I not worthy? Am I not lovable? Am I not hot? Like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I get this like envy. So I know for me, it's like, boom, that's about my worth and my, I guess like my feelings of inadequacy being exposed um, or or like desirability. And then stuff around like, I, a lot of people ask us like, well, what about if he falls in love with someone? And funnily enough, that's not something that comes up a lot for me because I think just knowing Greg as a person, like he's not a super emotional person and he doesn't get really attached to people. Um, neither of us really do. And we've had a lot of discussions around what we believe love is. Um, and so being excited about someone new I wouldn't define that as love. Um, And I think that's what people worry about. Perhaps it becoming a love. Sure, that could happen. But it would happen over a long period of time. Like I'm not someone who falls in love quickly. Greg is not someone who falls in love quickly. We personally don't believe that you fall in love that quickly. I think you can fall in lust. You can be infatuated. You can have a lot of new relationship energy and just be super excited. But the love, you know, happens further down the track when you really know someone Mm -hmm. um, and you end up loving them for the bad shit as well as the good shit. I think early on you're typically in love with someone for just the good sides of them because that's all you're really seeing. Um, so the falling in love thing hasn't ever come up because we've not experienced it where none of us have had feelings for anyone else. Um, and also we just, yeah, like I said, aren't worried about it happening overnight like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, jealousy is hard. Like it's, it's usually just, I feel really insecure. And actually before I, I, I know you're about to talk, but I, um, have had like almost a jealousy regression, you could call it where, Um, I actually saw someone talking about your window of tolerance and your window of tolerance is essentially all the things that you can tolerate on that day or that week. And if it's really full, you can't tolerate a lot more on top of it. And you've got to find ways to empty it out or expand the window so you can tolerate more. And so this person's talking about using breathing practices to downregulate your system, to empty your window of tolerance and simultaneously expand it. I would argue that right now my window of tolerance is extremely full. (laughs) So it's like his example was if your window of tolerance is full and you have someone cut you off in traffic, that's when you are most likely to be like crazy with road rage (laughs) or your boss says something critical to you. You're going to get really defensive and pissed off about it. It's like you just when you're starting to lose your shit, it's like you know that your window of tolerance is probably full, if not like flowing over. Mm -hmm. And right now, my window of tolerance, like using that analogy is very full. And so when Greg's telling me about dates that he's got planned, I'm like, I am not handling this well. Like, oh my God. And I can feel myself being like, what does she look like? I want to see what her Instagram or dating profile is. Or like, maybe he really likes her. And like, like I'm just not good enough. Like, so (laughs) I know that sometimes my jealousy is a reflection of where I'm personally at. And some days I'm not, I'm not able to tolerate a lot. And then other weeks it's like, oh, amazing. I hope you have the best time ever. Why don't you just like have five dates in a row? Like, you know what? Go have an orgy, like enjoy, you know, I'm like super cool with it. But then there are weeks where I'm just like, this is really, really hard. I've got a lot of other stuff on my plate. This feels like a lot. So it, it, it's, it's, it comes and goes in waves. Yeah. Yeah. How, like, I can so imagine having like how it could just overflow like that, but like when, when you are feeling like that, when you are like, no, the window of tolerance is full. I am like, if anything goes wrong, I'm going to explode. How do you kind of downregulate from there and like empty the window, I guess? Um, There has been one instance where I actually asked Greg not to go on a date. Mm. So that is something that we will, we don't have a, a, a few couples that are open or non-monogamous have what they call a veto rule. So you can veto a date, you can veto a partner, you can veto a hookup. You can just for no reason say like, no, that's not okay. I can't, I don't want you to do that. 
we don't have that rule because what we would prefer to do is just like talk about it if it comes up. And so that's kind of what's happened in one case. I was just feeling super shitty. I was like just a mess crying. Like I was like, there's a lot of stuff again, window of tolerance was full with so many other things. And then this was in addition to that. So I was just not handling it well. And I, he'd kind of offered, but not outright said it. And I was like, look, I need to ask you to, can you cancel your date? Like, can you stay here with me? Um, and so he has done that once. It's something that, you know, I would prefer to avoid doing because the whole point of the relationship is that we have independence and freedom and it's a gift that he gives me and I give to him in return. Mm -hmm. um, but it is still an option. So it's like, we're still each other's primary um, and priority. But in terms of dealing with just general levels of jealousy or insecurities or fears that come up, um, you can kind of do a couple of things. Like some of it is to do with like being preoccupied, like preoccupy yourself with doing something healthy, like um, going for a walk, going to the gym, getting the energy out for me is massive. So like for me, sometimes it's like get in the car, throw really loud music on and go for a drive like that helps me down regulate get some energy out of my system get out of the space as well like I think sometimes being in the house I'm just like I'll turn into just like this puddle on the bed and I'm like ah oh. so getting out of the house can be really good um just finding other things to do or putting your energy into something else I've heard people talking about like getting hobbies so like crochet or something like a video you know whatever it is that you can put time and energy into and invest in that's beneficial for you um, and then other things like journaling, I do a lot of journaling. I like to journal and it just, again, it helps me kind of channel out the thoughts that are on loop for me. Cause I get a lot of that. I know when I have thoughts like rotating, I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm due to journal and get it out and just like put whatever on paper. And what's nice about journaling is I can say all the worst things in my head, like <laughs> the judgmental, horrible, mean, or, you know, the stuff that I know isn't true, the super emotional stuff, super insecure stuff. I can put it on paper and it doesn't matter. I don't, I can be judgment free because no, no one's going to read it. Like I don't even read it back. I can just word vomit on paper. Mm -hmm. So journaling is really good. Um, and then sometimes it's just learning to sit with it. And that's kind of where I'm at with literally today I know Greg's we're going away I've got five days in New Zealand he's got a couple of days in Melbourne so I know he's potentially got three dates lined up and I'm just like oh okay all right so I kind of just have to sit with it and I've always been I, I've always hated crying like I'm not good with dealing with sad emotion and crying in an outpouring of emotion I have like a history of hearing like family members cry and I'm just like I cannot stand it it's the drama it's over the top I just can't deal with it what I've actually learned about myself is that when I let myself cry like have a really good cry for like 15 minutes I always feel better mm -hmm. and so <laughs> Sometimes if I'm dealing with the feeling, the best way for me to confront it is to fully delve into it and just indulge in feeling miserable and dramatic and crying and like, just like, you know, that real ugly crying. And <laughs> I eventually usually cry myself out or I get over the crying and you feel better. Like I just, it's kind of become a tool for me and it's really weird because I've always been so resistant to crying. Um, but now I cry a lot <laughs> and it's usually a good thing because it means I'm like working through an emotion rather than avoiding it or tiptoeing around it or distracting myself or numbing out. You know, like we talk about food. It's like, I would have quite happily gone and gotten takeouts and some dessert and like whatever. Now it's like, okay, just fucking cry. And then you're good. And then you move on to the next thing and you're okay. And you, you gain perspective again. Something, something about crying just gets it all out. So that has been <laughs> one of my tools lately. So if you come in here, I'm like, a date night around like 7 p.m. You might just find me like bawling my eyes out. And then about 15 <laughs> minutes later, I'm like the happiest person you've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, someone's, uh, I can relate so much. I come from like a family where no one really cried and it was like, just dust yourself off, keep going basically. So that's something I also have worked on a lot. And then someone said to me recently, like obviously here in Bali is quite spiritual um, mm. and loads, people have loads of emotions and feelings and they're not really afraid of showing it. So it's, very eye-opening experience and someone said to me that crying is like a bath for the soul and it's just oh. cleansing and I was like I got that's the perfect that. word cleansing that's what it feels like it yeah. feels like a cleanse of your you emotion. just clean yourself out I'm like oh my god because that's literally what it feels like after you're like 
ah, I can breathe yeah. again. I'm clean. Like I've emptied out all my pores. This is ah, nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you just, you do, you feel lighter. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess, would you ever consider like not being in that, like, um, like, would you ever consider having like a mon- fully monogamous relationship, just you two? We've actually talked about it because we've definitely, especially early on when we were like just enamored with each other and falling in love, it was like, yeah. why are we, why do we do it? Like, it's not like there's anyone else that I've met that's better than you. It's, and I think, you know, in some scenarios with people that are dating semi seriously, you are often dating someone until you meet someone else that's better. You know, like that's often kind of the position that people find themselves in. Like, mm-hmm. I'll stay with you, I guess, like, unless something better comes along. And so sometimes that's what dating other people while being with Greg has felt like. It's like, well, if I meet someone else better, who knows? But obviously that's never happened and I don't think it will happen. Um, and, and not that there's zero risk, but it just hasn't happened. Um, so it's funny where I feel like I meet people that, that Greg sets such a high bar that I'm like, Oh man, I'm just constantly disappointed. Like dating <laughs> is bad enough. And then when you've got an incredible partner, who's a, a great human being, who's just generous with his time, he's good at taking care of me. He's just incredibly empathetic. He's like super emotionally intelligent, like just like the best person ever and then you go dating and you're with people who don't really give a fuck about you and just want to hook up and haven't done much with their lives you're like oh I'm really (laughs) not missing out on much like it's just I'm like "Eh." so I've been through a lot of periods where I'm like "Uh, we would be great monogamous like we would do really well um but we kind of got to this position where we were like you know what I would rather be on the non-monogamous side of the fence going we could totally be monogamous and we would work rather than going to the monogamous side of the fence. And at some point saying, Hey, like one of us being like, I kind of want to be non-monogamous again. So we were like, you know what, let's, let's stay on this side saying we could do that and we would, we would enjoy it and it would be great. And like, maybe that would be nice rather than kind of just, you know, flirting with it rather than being in that position going, fuck, I need to get out now. Um, So that's kind of one of the, decisions that we made. And then the other thing that we've discovered is when you're in a relationship, the idea of seeing other people probably sounds quite self-serving. Like it's, especially if you're a female with a guy who gets to sleep with other females, I think a lot of women will be like, oh, so you're just going to like let your man go and fuck up as much pussy as he wants. Like he's going to be living the dream. You're just going to give that to him. Like, don't you have any respect for yourself? I think there's a little bit of a perception of that where like he gets everything that he wants. Mm. It's not quite like that because I also do the same, right? Like I can go and hook up with as many people as I want. There's no one penis policy in this house. So it's <laughs> like, it's, it's the, it's game on, you know, it's, it's equal. But um, the thing that we've discovered is as much as we thought it would help us feel independent and have a sense of freedom and autonomy, while it does do that, it also serves the relationship. And I just explained it. Every time I meet someone, I'm like, oh, wow, fucking Greg is amazing. I like the way he kisses better. I like the conversations better. I like our connection better. No one fucks me like Greg. Like, you know, it's like there's all these, I guess, immediate comparisons between Greg and other people. And it's not deliberate. It's not like I'm out there comparing everybody to him, but it's it's impossible not to do. And so all that happens is it reflects back really positively on Greg and our relationship. And so I have these really positive feelings about being with Greg Um, And on top of that, you get a big ego boost when you know that you're desirable and attractive to other people. That's always super nice because being validated is is good. Our human brains love it. So that's nice. Um, And then there was one other thing that I was going to say. Oh, things like jealousy, things like hard emotions and struggling. And like I said today, like just I, I was crying already this morning. Like I'm like, this is so hard that brings us closer because we have these conversations constantly. Like, you know, it's almost like every few nights we have some really deep conversation about our relationship, about what we want, about the future, about what things will look like that often come up because of the non-monogamy thing, because we're talking to other people, we're dating other people, we're catching up about an experience we had or a feeling that came up. And so you find yourself 
at one, one of our rules is that we're transparent about everything. So you find yourself in these conversations that 100% wouldn't happen if you were monogamous. Um, but two, so many challenges you are deliberately stepping into, like watching your partner be with someone else or, you know, chatting to other people on your phone while your partner's in the same room. It's like, there are these things that are coming up that are going to bring up hard feelings. And we've chosen to talk about it all the time, every day or any time that we feel like we need to. So we're just having these conversations that make us ultimately closer. I know him better. I feel like I can trust him more. It's a super secure relationship because we're practicing being super honest and also practicing saying hard things to each other. You know, we, we even talked about that earlier with like, when you're a coach and you really care, you have to say stuff that sometimes the other person doesn't want to hear. And that's, I guess, a little bit of, not a rule, but it's um, a value that we have where it's like, you know what, I'm going to tell you things that I know might hurt you sometimes or would be hard for you to hear and experience, but it's in the name of being totally transparent. So like, you know, whenever Greg tells me about a date, he's like, it's really hard for me to do that, but he does it. And we've talked about it and, and we've played around with ways that it's better for him. And like, like, you know, whatever. And then for me, it's like when we reconnect afterwards, Greg loves to reconnect by being physical immediately. I kind of have to like creep back towards the physical connection. I need to emotionally get back to like feeling safe before I can connect physically. So it's like, we've had to have hard conversations about that. Like, it's bizarre. It's like, okay, you just fucked someone else. I just fucked someone else. How do we come back together as a couple? Like you just don't have those conversations if you're monogamous. So it's, oh, it's God, bizarre, no. <laughs> but it's, it, it just makes you understand each other on a level that is like uh, so crazy deep. Um, and it, it's not that it's necessarily better than monogamy. Like it's not more evolved. It's just that you go out of your way to have hard conversations consciously deliberately and the same thing can happen in monogamy if you make it make sure that you're figuring out how to have those hard conversations more regularly I've seen a bunch of videos about people where like relationships have ended over the dishes being left on the sink and even though it's just the dishes being left on the sink it's like it's actually a, a representation of a bigger issue and it's disrespect and it's like not listening to each other and it's not understanding what different people value and those little things are opportunities to have really curious conversations about like why do you feel like that why don't I feel like that why are we different on this you know what when you tell me to put the dishes away it grinds my gears it's like my mom telling me that stuff oh yeah I have this like history with my mom and like when I was growing up and I was a kid and it's like you know we've all got our own version of like trauma right and I think it's easy in monogamy to skip some of those conversations so if you're deliberate about having them in the same way that they come up in non-monogamy, you can have those conversations in monogamy. And like the more honest, hard conversations you have, I really believe the better the relationship will be. Yeah, oh, a hundred percent. And God, I think maybe you should start a relationship uh, coaching channel as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, no, I'm still just learning. I'm gonna my coaching advice is like, okay, well, just try crying. Have you tried that? Okay, <laughs> try um, crying. That'll work. <laughs> have you have you gone for a long drive with music on? Okay. Um, <laughs> oh god I still have so many things that I want to ask you but I'm still running out of time um so I'm also I know that you're a very busy woman so I don't want to keep it too long but um <laughs> I'm sure people are gonna be like I want to listen to her podcast I want to see her channel like I'm gonna work with her please like plug yourself in any way that you want um yeah well if you want to hear me talk more about the relationship stuff um Greg and I do a podcast called Gone Rogue which ironically rogue is like the equipment brand in the U S for CrossFit, <laughs> but it just going rogue was just the perfect term. So I was like, screw it. It's going to be gone wrong. <laughs> um, so if you hop on any like podcast streaming service, like you'll, you'll find it, it's on most of them. Um, and we're f almost 40 episodes deep. So they're kind of sporadically spread out. We don't have any consistency in timing because we do it when we've got an interesting interview with someone or an interesting topic to actually dive into. They're fairly long podcasts. So that maybe makes up for the frequency being a little bit more spread out. Um, so that's the relationship stuff. And then I, I talk about my relationship a little bit on Instagram. Not so much. People, I, I lose so many followers every time I talk about non-monogamy or sex. Really? It's wild. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, it, it's not been super positive. Although I do believe that it is good to filter out people that aren't fully on board with who you are. So every now and again, I'll still drop some kind of bomb in there. 
Yeah. Yeah. But uh, my Instagram is CF Kate and then the nutrition coaching, you'll find all the links on my CF Kate page and, and it goes to the website and it goes to all the information. We have got the books closed at the moment for nutrition coaching, but they reopen in like two and a half weeks. So um, it's like 16 days or something. So the weekend of Tori and Pro is actually when we reopen, we're going to have a stand at Tori and Pro. So we're going to be doing like mini consults, talk, talking to people. We have our whiteboard trackers at Torian Pro, which is really cool. They sell those online as well. Um, so for all that kind of stuff, CF Kate is kind of your one-stop shop to get any information. So go go there. If you're looking for more CF Kate, go to CF Kate. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, we'll definitely link all of this in the show notes as well. And this podcast, we're on the 9th of May now. So this will be probably be out in a week. So when you guys listen to this, you only have to wait a few more weeks and then oh, yeah. we'll have yeah. spots like open week for week. you. Um, so Tate, thank you so much again for coming on. Um, I already knew that I like was obsessed with you and everything that you were about. <laughs> and now I'm just even more obsessed. So oh, yay. thank you. <laughs> I'm glad you like me more. It'd be problematic if you're like, oh, you know. Yeah, like, oh, probably shouldn't release this episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But guys, thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Please, as usual, if you'd like that, make sure you do take a screenshot. You tag myself, you tag Kate, you tag Women's Fitness Academy. Um, we absolutely love when you do this. And so many people have recently. So that makes me so, so happy. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions about anything that we've just spoken about, just reach out to myself or Kate. We're always happy to have a little chat to you. Um, and if you are going to Torian, make sure you go and say hi to Kate and talk to her in the stand. I'm very yes. jealous. I wish I was going, but it's it's a little bit too far for me to go at the moment. <laughs> it is. <It's> a <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much for listening and I'll see you guys later.